Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to another episode in the series here. Uh, I'd first like to apologize for dropping you on a uh, cliffhanger there in the last episode. I definitely did not plan that or, or want that to be the case. Uh, however, if you are coming from the previous episode, I uh, thank you for following through with, uh, I guess, the, the next step in our progression here. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, it might be worth checking out the last video where we kind of got our application here up to speed uh, by our standards, which is the uh, Jetpack's navigation components and the MVVM architecture. Um, and then we went ahead and just ran the application, but actually ran into a problem here. And the issue that we had, um, the illegal state exception here says cannot access database on the main thread since it may potentially lock the UI for a long period of time. So uh, I cut the video or the last video because this was going to be a little bit more of, um, I guess, a, a lengthy discussion, right? It's not, it's not so much, um, th there is a simple solution, but I, I wanna take time to actually uh, go over what the solution is and, and how things work. And um, that is with the introduction of Kotlin coroutines. So if we just go ahead and think about everything that we have seen so far or about Android applications in general, um, we've really only been dating, dealing with one thread. And that thread is referred to as uh, the main thread in general programming, but also in the context of Android, it's also known or called the UI thread. Um, so all your lifecycle callbacks, anytime that you actually interact with the UI, um, you are doing that on one particular thread. And for instance, the part of the um, appeal here for the live data and observers uh, through the MVVM architecture is that when your observer gets fired and that this, in this case, the item entity list is propagated to this block of code right here, um, it guarantees that this is going to be running on the main thread. So under the hood, if you were to be fetching data in a network thread or, or doing some long-standing operation in a background thread, posting that data to this live data, um, the observation of that data, of the change of that data, will actually uh, occur as an event on the main thread or the UI thread. So you have free reign to modify the UI, change, uh, you know, and, and do things that you want to um, or, or that you need to, to, uh, you know, have your application actually work. So there's uh, really this idea that the main thread is the only thread that should be modifying the UI. If we take a look again at the uh, verbiage here, cannot access database on the main thread, we kind of know what that is now, since it may potentially lock the UI for a long period of time. So because, again, this is all happening on one single thread, if we actually take a look, the stack trace here tells us in the onCreate of the main activity is where we actually call this, right? And so we call the init function. That trickles down to the to buy view model init on line 17. So if we take a look at that, um, well, okay. So the init function is on 14, but the blocking call or the next call in the sequence here is on line 17. And that is the repository get all items, repository get all items. Um, and then we go ahead and look at the item DAO underscore implementation, which is part of you know what Room does for you, builds an implementation class, and get all entities, which under the hood is actually, as you can see here, um, this is the implementation class of our DAO that we have. And so this actually uh, has your little SQL query here, um, selecting all of them, running the, uh, basically the SQL on the SQLite database, and then trying to pull everything out of the database here and return it to you um, in, a, in a list of item entities. So all of that is going on under the hood, and all we see here is essentially, <laughs> essentially this. Um, so I guess it might not be obvious what's going on with this function or how things work, but that implementation class is actually how, you know, it's what bridges the gap between um, this code that we end up writing and how it interacts with the database. But we can see here um, that it may potentially lock the UI for a long period of time. 
So if your database has five items in it, that operation to get all the items might actually just happen very quickly. Uh, but if it has 500 items, it's going to happen slightly slower. If it has 5,000 items, it's going to happen a little slower. And 50,000, 500,000, etc. Um, you know, it'll just continually happen slower. So because the app doesn't know anything about the size of the da data that it's pulling, it just goes ahead and, and throws a blanket statement saying, hey, you can't really do this on the main thread because we can't guarantee that it's going to happen um, in a short enough period of time that the user is not just going to see like a white screen because as you can see here, the onCreate function uh, is where this gets called, right? Is where this all happens. So imagine this operation here, um, the whole init and, and getting all these items, imagine it actually took two seconds or five seconds, let's say, um, to actually run that code. Um, that means that this onCreate function, because it's all happening in a single thread, this onCreate function is hanging for five seconds. It's not actually um, allowing the system to do the rest as far as you know, in, in actually inflate and display this uh, layout and then eventually build the, um, the home fragment here that we have and build the home fragments layout and display everything on screen. It would actually just appear as a white screen to the user for five seconds and then everything would resume. So I just wanted to take a look at the documentation here um, under the overview tab on the uh, basically the room um, article here on the Android developers website. Uh, there is an optional import here for the Kotlin extensions and coroutine support for room. So I'm just going to double check that we have that. And it actually does look like we, we have it, uh, which is just fantastic. Um, so that's already imported there. So the first thing that we're going to have to go ahead and do here is actually instruct the uh, function or, or change the function declarations to play nicely with Kotlin coroutines. So here we just have a regular function to find uh, to get all of our item entities. And if we were to preface this function here with the word suspend, that actually is now you know taking a step down the route of Kotlin coroutines and essentially telling the compiler and telling uh, you the, as the developer that this function in particular can only be called within something that's called a coroutine context. So if we go ahead and actually take a look at where we are using this function, we're using it in our repository class and you can see here the little squiggly line that comes up says the suspend function should be called from a coroutine or another suspend function. Uh, and you can see here this little line uh, now has this interesting icon that kind of denotes that this is a suspend function being called. This line in particular is a suspend function. Um, and so we're actually going to kind of bubble this motto up here. Uh, so if we go ahead and create this function as a suspend function, now since this is a suspend function, we can call another suspend function within it. Um, and then if we go ahead and take a look at our uh, our implementation or our, our single usage of that one function, uh, we get the same error here. Basically saying the exact same thing, that it needs to be called within a coroutine context or another suspend function. And so, oh, okay, let's just add suspend here and then blah, 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 it's just going to keep trickling up and the error is going to go away. Well, fortunately, the view model is the correct place to actually go ahead and do, uh, do exactly this. So um, we're going to cut this out and we are going to say view model scope launch and then paste everything in. And you can see here this little like tooltip that pops up here says this colon coroutine scope. And so now inside of this launch block here, we are actually within a coroutine scope. And so if you watch some of the previous episodes, you could see um, that I kind of did this to, to maybe provide like a very small delay here for, you know, uh, that's not five, for 5,000 milliseconds or five seconds. Um, and I was actually doing that within the, the view model scope to launch. It's just a really quick way to kind of spin up a coroutine and basically accomplish the idea of multi-threading. So the idea of coroutines is just a simplified version of uh, threads and something that is just a little bit easier for you as the developer to 
uh, manage, to, to think about, to wrap your head around. And so this view model scope dot launch here, um, this view model scope, I guess, let's say, is actually a part of the extension function that exists within the view model class itself. And so it has a quick way to get a coroutine scope for this given view model. And it's kind of the appropriate way to um, accomplish multi-threading within the view model scope. Without getting too much further into view model scopes, what's or, or coroutine scopes, what's worth noting is that the owner of the scope, you know, if they are destroyed, then so is the scope, and therefore any of the jobs that are running. So the idea is that because we're using this view model scope, if for whatever reason this view model gets destroyed, uh, these coroutine actions or these jobs are getting canceled, they also get destroyed. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, well, there's that thread that's running in the background, and I need to make sure, you know, to, to keep track of it and actually you know, stop it or, or delete it or destroy it or whatever the case is if we are no longer uh, on the screen that has that particular uh, usage for that thread, etc. So if it's, so hopefully that kind of makes, you know, some sense to you and, and this is kind of falling in line with the idea of the MVVM architecture having this life cycle awareness um, to their uh, structures to their components, you know, the, the observer here on the live data only gets invoked when this fragment is in a good state to observe the data. Um, and so it's a similar concept here where the view model scope is only going to be active or it's only going to be running if this view model is in an uh, inactive state, is, has not been destroyed or anything like that. Uh, fortunately for us, we've actually scoped this view model. If you remember from the previous episode, we've scoped this view model to the activity. So if for whatever reason we were to leave the home fragment and we had some long running operation happening in the view model scope, that operation is still going to live even though our fragment and still going to continue even though our fragment has been destroyed because this view model is scoped at the activity level. If the activity gets destroyed, well, in this case, the whole application is going to get destroyed, you know, i.e. the user killed the app or something went wrong uh, with the device and, and we ran out of memory and the system killed our app. Um, so if the, if the activity is gone, then at this point, so would our view model and anything happening um, here inside of our, inside of our uh, view model scope. So let's go ahead and run this now and let's take a peek. Let's see if we run into any issues here. And uh, let's see if we actually solved our problem. Okay, wonderful. So we have our success, our, success, our operation succeeded. Uh, we have our app up and running and our app is completely empty. Um, hopefully that's not a surprise. We don't have anything in our database. We don't have anything to show. And even if we had 10 items in our database and it was propagated to this live data, we're not even doing anything with that live data. So um, there's nothing to see here. Uh, it actually even tells us that there's no adapter on our recycler view, so it's skipping the layout. Uh, pretty smart. One thing that I want to show you here, though, to hopefully wrap your mind around um, or help wrap your mind around the idea of the view model scope, coroutines, etc., uh, is put in a few log statements here to um, kind of showcase the different, I don't know, I guess options uh, or, or kind of show you how things are going to actually happen here. So if we go ahead and rerun this now, just want to take a look at our, uh, don't really care for the app because we've seen it, it's blank, but I do want to see the output here and see how our uh, log statements come in through here. Right, so we have coroutine one, two, and three here. Um, so hopefully this can actually, uh, hopefully this makes sense, right? Even though when you look at this block of code here in, um, in, in, in sequence, like you would any other block of code, uh, you're like, okay, well this line of code executes, this line of code executes, then this, then this, then this, then this, right? So we just run linearly. Um, and what you can actually see here based on the output is that it looks like this line of code runs and then this line of code runs and then we make ourselves our, our way back to this line of code and that actually runs. So let's just go ahead real quick to even um, to amplify this a little bit more. 
We're going to put a one and a half second delay after we read everything from our database. One, two, three. Right. So you can see here that although this looks linear to us as developers, it's actually happening in a multi-threaded fashion. Um, and specifically, the, the, the beginning of this function runs properly. This part of the, of the code basically spins up a new thread under the hood, ends up running this code in a background thread, sleeps the thread. The delay is basically the Java version or Java equivalent of sleep for a particular uh, number of milliseconds. And then, and then this block of code completes. So this actually here is, is happening out of sequence, if you will. So the best way to think about this uh, code here is that before you go ahead and invoke any or do anything in a coroutine scope, it runs as normal. When you do things in a coroutine scope, uh, the, the sequence of this scope will actually happen linearly like regular code would. However, the suspending operations, in this case getting all of the items, can actually happen uh, like it like it will wait for this to actually happen uh, here and, and pause at this moment in time until that function ends up returning and then everything else can proceed in execution and all while that is happening the rest of the thread or the main thread is still going on in the background and is still executing things um, as expected so uh, hopefully that's a reasonable introduction, if you will, to Kotlin coroutines. Um, and with a little bit more exposure and a little bit more practice with it, I think it's going to make uh, a whole lot of sense. And hopefully if you are coming from Java and coming from this idea of a background thread and, and actually having to manage your own threads, that this... I think we all would be able to agree that this implementation is a whole lot easier than uh, everything else that you had to do in a previous, uh, you know, the, the old way, if you will. Uh, I guess the key thing here is that any of these functions that can take a indeterminate, uh, undefined amount of time to complete, you need to wrap in a, or you need to preface the function with the keyword suspend telling the code, telling the compiler that, hey, you know, this is uh, an operation that we don't know when it's going to finish, uh, so we need to kind of be able to handle that appropriately. So um, it's going to be a good idea for us to probably wrap all of these in. So uh, hopefully that makes sense and is enough information to, uh, I guess, kind of intro you to co uh, Kotlin coroutines. And at this point, it seems like it's enough to actually, you know, get the app up and running. And so because of that, we are going to kind of put any further coroutine discussion um, on hold for now, just to get the rest of the app up and running and continuing, uh, you know, building out <laughs> this you know what, what we want to see here uh, because we're still you know still haven't done much um, as far as getting the app to a workable state uh, but we are able to you know now start actually enhancing the application itself a lot of the other stuff was either boilerplate or set up and config code so uh, in the next episode we're going to go ahead and you know let's build our, our epoxy set up there or epoxy view holders uh, and I guess this would be a really good time to handle an empty state because we don't have anything um, in our database so we, we should display an empty state so uh, I hope to see you there we will start to implement our UI layer a little bit more in the next episode and then all of this stuff will start to come together and we will actually be able to get things on screen so I hope you're excited for it I am and I will see you in the next one